Uh, really, really happy to have all of you here today. I wanted to start out with a couple of thank yous to Victor, to Eddie, um, to my staff at the Conservancy, Claudia Prats and Angelica Gonzalez. Where's Angelica? And her child. Hello. Um, thank you so much for coming. And well, thanks for all the help that you've given in arranging this event. Um, I really appreciate all of you. I also want to thank Jackie Sullivan. Jackie, give a wave. Um, and Jackie, um, it's so lovely to have you here to honor Jack's legacy as we do every year. Um, I'm welcoming everyone here on behalf of the Conservancy. I wanted to start out with a brief land acknowledgement first to recognize that we are on the traditional lands of the Tongva, San Gabrieleno, Luiseño, Cahuilla, Serrano, as well as other tribal people and um, who are caretakers of this land, past, present, and future. And I think it's particularly apropos given the content of Anne's film to start with an acknowledgement because you'll see that the threads of indigeneity are very, very strongly represented in a way that's totally unique, I think, to Anne's film in terms of the landscape that, um, that she's talking about. Um, since 2016, we've been hosting an annual lecture series named for in honor of um, Professor Jack Sullivan, uh, who um, taught at Pitzer from 1975 to 2007. And his commitment to water issues um, is what is the the inspiration for this series and um, which is meant to be a, a for there's all usually it's lectures, but occasionally there will be a film screening. So it's meant to be a forum for public engagement and education about water in California and beyond. We're exceptionally excited to have Anne Kaneko here to screen her film. And um, also we're excited to have Monica Embre and Naomi Hirahara, who I'm definitely fans of both of these wonderful women. Alan Omoto will tell you more about them. Uh, for now, I would like to invite um, Alan Omoto, our Dean of Faculty, to um, introduce our speakers in the film. Oh, in terms of Naomi, award-winning author, this is her new book. It's called Clark and Division. Pick up your copy at a bookstore near you. Okay, Alan. Thanks, Susan. Um, so as soon as I'm the Dean of Faculty, so I wanna welcome you on behalf of Pitzer College to this event tonight. I wanna to thank Susan in particular, as the director of the uh, Redford Conservancy for the work in all the work that she does, but also for this event, as she said, her staff at the Conservancy, the staff in the Dean of Faculty's office and our AV staff for uh, assisting tonight and for helping to plan everything today. So the plan for tonight will be that we will, uh, I will introduce the, the filmmaker who's here today. She'll say a few words uh, and then we'll screen the film. And then following the film, there'll be a panel discussion, um, hence the table up here. Um, I'll say that I'm particularly excited and thrilled to be here um, and be able to introduce this screening and the filmmaker and the distinguished panel tonight. Um, that I'm the grandchild of a Japanese immigrant, so I'm a sansei in this uh, here, um, third generation that is, um, and that Manzanar is a part of my family history and its legacy has contributed to my lifelong commitment both personally and professionally to um, my values and to my professional work along the lines of social justice and human rights. So my father's family um, lived on Bainbridge Island, Washington. And when he was the age of most of our Pitzer students here, he was just starting college, um, was when Executive Order 9066 was issued that ordered the relocation of Japanese and Japanese descendants off of the West Coast. And Bainbridge Island was actually the first place from which people were evacuated. And so my dad, his brother, my grandmother were packed up with everyone else and uh, moved off of Bainbridge Island and were relocated to a newly and still being constructed internment camp in Manzanar, California, in the Owens Valley. Um, so my father <clears throat> was held there with his mother and his brother, as I said, but um, he always talked about his experiences, which is not necessarily common among Japanese Americans, and um, talked about his feelings and experiences of injustice and how the government actions against American citizens and um, the coercive effect of that throughout his life and um, its impact on him and his uh, 
trajectories. Uh, and that was, he's one story among 120,000 others of people in, impacted by that event. So I have since visited Manzanar several times, including with my siblings. And I will tell you, and you'll see this, that it's a beautiful and yet austere place. Um, but it's also filled with ghosts and archeological remains and artifacts of injustice and environmental degradation. So I'm thrilled for all of us tonight to be able to learn more about the history of Manzanar and that place. And I'm especially pleased to introduce you to the filmmaker, Anne Kaneko. So Anne is known for her personal films that weave her intimate aesthetic with the intricacies of political reality. She's an Emmy winner, and her work has been screened internationally and been broadcast on PBS. She's been commissioned by the National Endowment for the Arts, the California Endowment, and the Skirball Cultural Center. Her credits include A Flicker in Eternity, which is based on Stanley Hayama's Miami's diary, also Against the Grain, an artist's survival guide to Peru, highlighting Peruvian political artists, and 100% Human Hair, a musical for the AFI Directing Workshop for Women. Anne is fluent in Japanese and Spanish, and she's been a Fulbright and a Japan Foundation Artist Fellow. She's a member of New Day Films, a distribution cooperative. She has an MFA from UCLA, and I'm also proud to say, teaches at Pitzer College, and um, is here uh, this evening, and she's an artist mentor for VCs Armed with the Camera. So I want to welcome Anne to introduce her film to you tonight. And I said, and then afterwards, I will introduce you to our other panelists and we'll have some um, panel discussion and then some open Q&A. But thank you again for being here this evening. Anne. Well, um, this is very um, meaningful to be here since I feel like Pitzer has been my home now since uh, 2014, um, you know, I've been a part of the community here and in teaching in the media studies department. And so I really, I want to acknowledge my students who are here um, and, and my, and the, the, and the IMS, right? The Intercollegiate Media Studies um, staff, as well as my colleagues um, who've been so supportive of this film over the five, six years that this process has been going on, this, this just long gestation pro process. So, um, you know, and I, I will say that, um, you know, much of the footage that's shot in this film was shot on, um, uh, you know, the cameras from this department. So thank you to, um, you know, Stephanie Hutton, who is not here with us. She, she's left the department, but she moved on to Florida, but her husband, Flo, made this beautiful poster. Um, and of course, Eddie, Eddie, who's always there and, you know, has also photographed um, some of the aerial footage of, of the aqueduct here in Los Angeles. And of course, my colleagues who watched an early cut of the film. So thank you. But it's so meaningful to be here. And I hope you enjoy the film. And we'll have a, 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 a hopefully, um, interesting conversation after this. So thank you. I've told you a little bit about Anne already, but now let me introduce the other panelists. The next panelist is Naomi Hirahara. She is an Edgar Award-winning writer of the Masarai Mysteries and nonfiction history books for both adults and children. Clark and Division, the book that Susan showed you at the very beginning, her first historical mystery is set in 1944 Chicago and follows the Los Angeles family's release from wartime detention in Manzanar. A former editor of the Rafu Shimpo newspaper, she was part of the original team who developed the exhibition at the Visitor Center at the Manzanar National Historic Site. Naomi. And the last panel says, you've met in the film. <laughs> that is uh, Marga Mariko Embre. Uh, she's the granddaughter of Sukatomi Embre, who founded the Manzanar Committee and led the annual Manz Manzanar pilgrimage starting in 1969. As a community organizer based in LA, Monica follows her grandmother's footsteps 
um, <clears throat> excuse me, and is a member of the Manzanar Committee herself. For the last 15 years, Monica has worked to advance climate justice, leading efforts to phase out fossil fuels and advance affordable and accessible clean energy solutions. She is currently a senior associate director at the Sierra Club, leading California's five energy campaigns. Monica, come on up. So that I'm gonna get out of the way and turn things over to Naomi, right? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was just uh, a meditative master masterpiece, Anne, so mm -hmm. congratulations. Mm -hmm. It was so neat. I've seen it on the small screen, but I have to admit, it's such an immersive experience to see it you know, on a big screen with all of you. And I know many of you are friends and supporters of these two. So um, I was trying to think, we can go in so many different directions. We have a limited time. And I think there's refreshments out there. And you all probably want to do a little bit of t individual talk story, too. So I was thinking um, the first part of this to go a little personal, because even Sue Kunitomi Embry talks about emotion. Um, there's uh, uh, Kathy Bancroft. She talked about um, the importance of stories and just the legacy of memory was also spoken of. So let's start there. I want people here, because you all um, have connections with this institute or with Pitzer, and I know our experts in this area of sustainability and um, environmental justice. So I want you to be part of this conversation as well. So Anne, um, first of all, I just on the personal side, I think your family, you have some connections to Manzanar. So if you could briefly go into that and how how did you find Kathy Bancroft? How did you find these different <laughs> strands? And and be and how did you uh, how were you able to braid it together? Um, so thank you. Um, and you know, I, I I felt after I spoke at the beginning, I was like, oh no, I didn't acknowledge the Redford Conservancy. So let me just first say <laughs> thank you to the Redford Conservancy. Mm -hmm. And to Alan for such eloquent words. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, we all have these connections. And so thank you for that. So, um, I, you know, in my in my COVID fog, I, I forgot that. So, you know, and, and Susan and Angelica have been so amazing in terms of organizing this. But um, so in terms of my connections to Manzanar, um, of course, I had been to Manzanar many times. My parents actually were not incarcerated mm -hmm. in Manzanar. My parents went to Jerome um, in Arkansas, and then um, also uh, I think they were in Granada for a little while. But, um, but obviously, as Japanese Americans, we have this deep connection to this history. It, it, I think it didn't matter which camp they were at. And um, I think that my parents, my mother always tells me that she was supposed to go to Manzanar. She's from San Diego and San Diego folks, many went to Manzanar, but because my grandfather was um, in one of the DOJ camps, the Department of Justice camps, he was actually in um, Louisiana at the time when they, the family was getting moved around. And so that's why they went to Arkansas. So, um, but in terms of Manzanar, um, uh, uh, some colleagues had asked me to, to do some, you know, to join them in this humanities project to go and think about intercultural and interfaith connections through particular um, spaces, right? And so the pilgrimage obviously has, a, has been a real intersection for Muslim Americans, Japanese Americans, and you know, just folks who are interested in learning about history. And so that's really sort of what was the departure point. And I think for me, you know, I'm a sensei. I'm a very young sensei. It was always, I always had been a bit reluctant to, to touch this history because, you know, I, I, I always wanted to sort of you know, um, explore my own identity, that this was not my own, this was, this history is not my only identity, you know, that doesn't, it isn't the only thing that marks me as a, as a Japanese American, right? So, so that's why I think I've been really reluctant to sort of, 
you know, go into this history, but a previous film, um, Flicker and Eternity, I realized, maybe because I'm older, I, 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 I realized, oh, but this really is my story, you mm -hmm. know, and this legacy has importance to me. And so I think I've been able to sort of own it a little bit more. I've, I, 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 I shed some of my own hangups around this. And, but however, I will say that Manzanar is, is a place which is, you know, there have been so many amazing films made about it. And, you know, because of its proximity to Los Angeles, it's like there's, the, you know, it, it's just this soup, you know, this really iconic place. Um, I think it's so important to the Asian American movement as well um, because of all of the work around redress and reparations. And so um, with all of that, I thought, what can I bring to this conversation that's different? Um, and I think that I've always been fascinated by the land and also this knowledge of, of sort of these connections between um, you know, Native Americans and Japanese Americans. Um, and then, of course, when every time I go to Manzanar, I, I, you know, it's like you go to Mono Lake, you go to these places and you read these signs and you read all of this about the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And it's such a sort of abstract idea of how those of us living in Los Angeles have connections to these faraway places. And so you, you, you think that you kind of understand this. But somehow we forget. And so then I realized as I was doing research for this project, I was like, oh, of course, all of these stories intersect in this place in this amazing way. And, and, and then, of course, I, I realized, I, I discovered that Monica had already done this research. And it's like, oh, I'm uh, so, you know, after I had sort of embarked on this process, I was like, oh, look. Monica's already done this research, but this was a film, which would be different, right? And that it also, I was determined to bring this story to the present because it felt had so much more resonant, you know, still has so much resonance to where we are right now. So, um, you know, and I think that because a film like this, it has had such a long gestation, it's really allowed me to, um, you know, the luxury of really trying to find a shape and a form and metaphor to bring these stories together. So, you know, early on, of course, it was clear that water was a, an important metaphor. And so I think in terms of filmmaking, it's always trying to find some kind of visual metaphor or, you know, emotional metaphor that can help to carry you through the piece. And so that's really, I think, once we kind of hit upon that, that and the land, you know, the structure of the piece started to fall into place. But of course, you know, editing a, a piece like this, which is complex and requires so much fine tuning, we had gone through many iterations of, you know, the chronological story, the, the story that was more character driven, <laughs> the story that was in chapter, you know, the film that was in chapters. And, you know, even though I think intuitively I knew that none of those would work, you just, you, you have to go through that process. Well, I, when I saw it here in the big screen and with the sound system, mm -hmm. the oral, mm -hmm. the sound, um, that's kind of a theme. I notice every time, like, the river, you know, mm -hmm. came on, water came on, there was, you know, kind of like this ominous, it almost had a personality you know, that it was very effective. So congrats on that. Um, Monica, I have like two, a two-parter for you. One, of course, is your relationship with your grandmother, Sue Kun Kunitomi Embry, and anybody who's been involved with Japanese American community in the 60s, 70s, oh, even before that, I guess, up to, you know, 80s, 90s, um, know, you know, knows about um, just the strength and power of Sue. But um, how, you know, I know you've seen this film quite mm -hmm. a bit. Uh, how are you feeling? I mean, I, I think there's the, I was also thinking about just like the legacy of trauma, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I was just wondering for you, mm -hmm. how do you feel uh, when you like see your, you know, grandmother talking about these stories? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? 
Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it a few times. And, oh my goodness. Thank you, Anne, so much um, for your incredible work. This has been a, a labor of love for, for a few years and just how incredible, uh, how well you did to incorporate so many different stories and, and weave in so many different characters and chapters. Um, I still get choked up. Every time I hear my grandma's voice, the first, mm. uh, she's like, you know, mm. Kathy speaks and then, and, and then I can hear her. And, and if you didn't know my grandmother, you're not going to recognize her voice, but I hear her voice the second mm. uh, she starts speaking. Um, and yeah, I can hear her talking to me, you know. Mm. And um, when I was a, a student on campus here at Pomona and um, would walk in the morning uh, during my first year, I took... Uh, Japanese, uh, and when I was walking to Japanese class, I would call her every morning while walking across the quad to campus, right? And so I have a very vivid memory of, of walking from my dorm room to the classroom uh, and, and chatting with her and, and hearing her, um, and also hearing her cough, mm -hmm. you know? Anne does a yeah. really phenomenal job with True. using sound, mm -hmm. and my grandmother's cough is also a, a I don't know, if it's a, it is a component, mm -hmm. um, and I remember her coughing always. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really here on campus and incredible mentors and professors in EA and uh, those who helped me understand environmental justice that had me realize it wasn't just a coincidence that she had a cough, right? There was uh, the externalities, the pollution, both from that particulate matter, from the bottom of a lake bed, that dust is not inert, it is, <laughs> has significant health impacts, but also living in LA living here in Southern California and our incredibly toxic air uh, means way too many of us have breathing problems and health issues. And so um, in the film, when I hear her cough, I remember her coughing. Um, and I was a, a first year here on campus and it was finals week um, when she actually passed away. Oh. And so I really, um, I really remember what it was like to be uh, a student and here, literally right here in, in this land and this place. Um, and uh, knowing my grandmother died way too young uh, and didn't need to pass away. And in part, I, uh, I attribute her passing um, to that pollution, both from the lake, so LAWP, and fossil fuel industries, um, and the pollution and the havoc that it wreaks on our lungs. And so um, that's part of it. And I guess it's not just, though, the, the sorrow and the loss. Mm -hmm. There is also some incredibly powerful resilience, you know? And, and that nickname that she got, which was the unquiet Nisei, because uh, she decided to not be quiet. She decided to speak up and to use her voice. And that was hard. That wasn't welcomed. Not only was that not welcomed like broadly in society, it wasn't welcomed within the Japanese American community. And it wasn't even welcomed in our family. Her own siblings were asking her, please stop. Don't rock the boat. You know, what happens when they decide to lock us up again? And it was really a trauma response from the family and the community and to say, no, what, they broke the Constitution once. Why won't they do it again? Don't, don't draw attention to us. Instead, let's put on an American flag pin and be all American and be the best Americans we can be so that they don't come after us again. Mm -hmm. um, and she understood that that was one way to respond, but another way was to demand justice and to make sure that the injustices that had happened to her and our family and an entire community didn't only get righted, but that it didn't happen to anybody else, because it can. Yeah, I love those um, footage of her with the bullhorn and <laughs> all that. Well, Anne referenced some of your research mm -hmm. that you had done. Can you briefly go over that? And also, I think one of the themes of this film is like um, different people kind of getting together for you know this common goal. And I'm sure you experience it in your work. But if you could go over those points as well. Yeah, so my undergraduate thesis. Um, in the beginning of the film, I mentioned an incredible class that I recommend students here, especially EA students take, um, by a professor, Char Miller, um, in EA at Pomona. It's called Water in the West. And I mentioned that class in the beginning, right, where he skipped over the 40s. Well, he's since incorporated <laughs> this history into it. And I often come back and guest lecture for a day, which is really fun. Um, but part of it is that, um, Learning that, that history, it was, it was actually Professor Miller's class that kicked it off for me and started really landing some connections on, on what these were. I, I, I actually changed majors. I was much more focused my first year on international relations and immigration and was really involved in multiple efforts on campus, worker support committee, and was doing labor organizing and immigrant rights organizing. 
And when my grandmother passed, I switched a lot more to health and, and the environment. I actually had never really thought about the environment as something that I really cared about. I considered myself someone in a social justice movement, but the environmental movement didn't seem to represent the communities that I come from, the places that I cared about. And so in part, amazing professors helped open up my eyes to the environmental justice movement and looking at the environment in a much more intersectional and deeply intrinsically connected way. And so um, my senior year, I did my thesis um, uh, on, a, on this story, on the, the forced relocation in and out of Payahunaru and how uh, incarceration was directly linked with water. And so just as Anne shows in the film, the, the way that water was not just the resource that made people leave a valley or be forced into the valley, but also had resistance. And, and you saw that reservoir where, you know, Kathy and used to swim in as a kid and others. And my favorite graffiti that literally the, you know, people like my great uncle who went early to set up the camp, literally poured the concrete. So they, they wrote graffiti in their, with their fingerprints in the wet concrete. And my favorite graffiti there, uh, it says, I love myself. <laughs> and that someone decided that even while being told that they were an enemy of the state, even while being put behind barbed wires where there were MPs with machine guns that faced in, right? that they were going to declare their own love for themselves and say that nobody, not even the US government, throwing them in a prison camp was going to make them not love themselves. Um, but that that was safe to declare underwater, right? That they had to literally write it in the concrete under the water in the reservoir as the place where they could hold that, that truth. Um, so yeah, so I got to my, my thesis. I think there's probably a copy at the ARC um, and in the EA library somewhere, um, <laughs> somewhere on these campuses. So I yeah. think it's online. It's, yep, and uh, yeah, I think you need to have. I downloaded it. <laughs> it's, it's too long. <laughs> Any current <laughs> students, you do not need to write that long. <laughs> it does I not need like, to be yeah. <laughs> several hundred pages. You don't need to do that. <laughs> but when it's you know, and honoring my grandmother, I got to incorporate poetry and art and and really trying to think about activism and, and resistance that way. That's it was really fun. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and for both of you, how about this, you know, these, I, I, I thought it was really fascinating, like Sue telling her story, Kathy telling her story. There's kind of similarities, mm -hmm. right? And then also towards the end, and you're kind of tying it together with mm -hmm. the groups kind of working, you know. Mm -hmm. and so any comments on... Um, um, well, before you were asking how I met Kathy, yeah. right? And... Um, you know, Kathy, I feel like she's family now, you know, I, 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 you know, she, she, somebody, uh, I think it was Bernadette, actually, it was Bernadette, who is the, who was the superintendent mm -hmm. at uh, Manzanar, um, said, oh, you should talk to Kathy. And um, it was actually this, at this moment when her son had just actually passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, oh my gosh, you don't need to talk to me in this moment. But she's like, sure, I'll talk to you. What else am I going to do, right? So, um, so I said, okay. But we immediately hit it off. You know, I feel like I told her at that point, I was like, I don't really know what I'm going to be doing with this film. But, um, you know, let's have a conversation. And I think she sort of was impressed that I knew more than the average bear. So my, my, my questions were a little bit more informed. But I, I think that again, it was, you know, through our interaction, you just learn so much about the place. And then I think in terms of Sue, you know, of course, this is a story that I've grown up with, I'm familiar with. But you know, it became a process of getting to know Sue, Sue Embry as well through, you know, listening to her and we kept putting more and more of her because she was like this voice from the past that, you know, still so much of what she said had resonance to the present. So um, I was so pleased to be able to, that there was that archive that we were able to incorporate her voice in that way. And so um, I think it became this process of sort of balancing these voices. And of course it's, you know, I think Nancy and Mary, the presence, the, their mm -hmm. story through their yeah. 
father as well as through yes. Rose, who is actually Nancy's daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so you see this, this again, this intergenerational commitment to this place and to you know, social justice through their family as well. And, um, you know, it's like that comment that Nancy makes about memory and about the, the you know, the, the, the approach of DWP to sort of erase memory. But that, that comment, even though it's in the context of DWP, has so much resonance for all of these other stories as well. And it's certainly, you know, in, in these Q&As that I do, it's like always people mention that. So, you know, it was this process of sort of balancing these different stories of and, you know, making sure that finding those connections between them. Yeah, and how about the Mountain Art Committee? I know you're an active member and working with the Pi Indigenous, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, your father's Bruce, <laughs> so he was instrumental. So can you, you know, comment or on that or anything related to that? Absolutely. So actually, my grandmother was very clear from the beginning that, you know, um, as she was doing this and in, in starting to help do this and, and recognizing that actually first the ministers would go back and actually go and pray because there's a cemetery um, at Manzanar. And so um, there's, you know, ministers have been going for years and years. But when she first started going in a really cold day in December 1969 um, and afterwards, mm -hmm. that, that they really needed to recognize that this land was native land and is native land. And so um, very, very early on in the 70s, developed a relationship um, with, with local tribal leaders. And so um, for years and years, right, we have the, the Manzanar pilgrimage every year. Um, and so we always start with a land acknowledgement and a, an official welcome. And Kathy is usually the one uh, who welcomes us to, to their land uh, to be able to have our, our ceremony and our pilgrimage there. Um, and so even though we're, we're virtual and remote again this year, and definitely tune in the last Saturday um, of April, I believe it's the 30th this year, we have an online program. Um, it starts with Kathy welcoming us, um, virtually even, right? To, to do that land acknowledgement is a, a really critical component. And you know, it was, it was so clear on that fight, um, especially on the solar farm, right? The, the incredible ways in which the, the Paiute Shoshone tribes and the Manzanar Committee and the Owens Valley Committee, where you have indigenous, Japanese American, and white folks all coming together, mm -hmm. not against solar in general, but against the wrong siting of solar. Mm -hmm. um, and I currently work for the Sierra Club, and we also joined that, right? Because we want to make sure our energy is powered 100% by clean, renewable energy. But where that solar is built matters. And putting it on cemeteries and sacred grounds is not acceptable, right? Um, we wouldn't put a, a major industrial facility in a Catholic or Christian cemetery or church. You wouldn't put it, uh, right? You, we have to understand where we site these places is so important. And in part, it's having relationships with local mm -hmm. tribes and indigenous leaders that you're able to know even where those places are. Yeah, it's, it's much more nuanced, right? It's it not, is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to kind of open it up to the rest of the group. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions? Um, I'll, I'll be asking Anne about um, the different kind of feedback she's had from different people. But since you all are here, um, ha how many people have been to Manzanar? Can you raise your hand? Mm. So quite a few. That's great. So any, what were the surprises to you? Any surprises in this film? Y'all weren't surprised? <laughs> and you could raise your hand. Anybody or any comments? Yes. Progress with regard to uh, the water? The water. Well, you know, it's it's a complicated issue. <laughs> I mean, I think that um Certainly, the, there's, there's ongoing issues in the valley. Um, the, actually, I just spoke to Kathy, and there had been some mining, mm -hmm. um, some exploratory mining that was being done around gold. And that company, I think because, in part because of this coalition that's come out of this film, you know, lots of voices spoke up and said, no, we don't need any more exploratory mining. And that actually that company is going to leave. Mm -hmm. We won. Yay. So they haven't left yet, 
<laughs> but they have said that they mm -hmm. will leave. So that is definitely a victory. I mean, the situation in terms of DWP, it's mm -hmm. ongoing. It still hasn't been resolved. And I think a lot of these issues, but you know, more, if more people know, there's more pressure on them and there's more accountability. And so I think that's all a good thing. Um, but I, I, and, and the other issue that I know that Kathy has been working on a lot is they're expanding the 395 along um, Olancha and near, um, you know, Paziata, the lake. And that's also culture, there are cultural resources there. That was the, that was the trail where they walked to go to Fort Tejon. So um, that's also an area that she's been working with, um, you know, with them to try to document this place. But, you know, it's, it's, it, these, these, con these issues continue. It doesn't go away. Um, I don't know if you have anything to yeah. add to that. I think that's right. And I think, you know, in part, that's, um, that's one of the things my grandmother taught me. Um, because when she first started doing this, um, when she went up uh, with Warren Furatani, who was like a student at the time, right? Mm -hmm. She went up with students, um, and she was a teacher. Um, it was students that actually helped launch and spark a movement, right? It was the 60s and 70s and, and the way organizing and activism on, on campuses especially was, was helping spark um, that. But it's not like she won overnight, right? It took years and years and years and blood and sweat and tears and, and that um, persistence, you know, I think uh, in the last uh, few years, especially under the previous administration, we heard a lot about resistance and the need to be resisting. Um, my grandmother taught me a lot about persistence and that you don't win a campaign overnight and that even when you win it, it can go away the next day, right? Actually really similar to yeah. I think, right? what, um, uh, what we shared in the film around they wait for you to, to not remember anymore mm -hmm. and for the next generation to come and forget and then they can take advantage of you again, right? So power is always operating, right? And so how do we make sure that we are also building our power um, to, to make those differences. And so, you know, I think for the mans in our committee, we engage on many, many different campaigns. Um, after 9-11, we did a ton of work in solidarity with Arab and Muslim Americans to call against racial profiling and xenophobia, to call against the detention of people. Um, and that's ongoing, right? And part of why you see uh, CARE in the film, we have a very close relationship um, with the Muslim community and, and continue to make sure that racial profiling doesn't happen. Uh, when young kids are getting locked up at cages in the border, we all, many Japanese Americans spoke out and said, no, we've seen this before, right? We, we are taking strong stances for comprehensive immigration reform and, and welcoming people and welcoming refugees. Um, and right now we're seeing a major attack on critical race theory, right? And what histories get to be told and what ideologies get to be uh, put forward. And, and uh, you know, we're working really hard uh, to call for that. Um, and we work really hard right now to call for reparations for people of African ancestry and in Congress, HR 40. And so um, when I think about what's the progress that happens from this film, it's, it's, there's always struggle, right? And so how do we keep being in, in solidarity with each other and, and making progress on those struggles? And um, hopefully I, we can get there. Yeah, I, I was just gonna mention also um, the solar farm, for example, I mean, it got postponed, you know, it's sort of been put off, but it could come back, you know, it really could come back because it's really about monetizing that valley. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, it's, it's really on pause. It seems to be on pause for a while, but it could come back. So, I mean, I think that all these issues, it's, 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 it's vigilance. You have to be vigilant and persistent and, um, and informed. Um, do we have time for just, we might have time for one more question and then we'll break and there's some refreshments outside. Does anybody have uh, uh, another question for the panelists? Yeah. Oh, did you already ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead here, but let me give you the mic. Well, oh, we have another question in the back. Victor has a question. Victor. Yay for Victor. <laughs> okay.
So, so DWP, um, I did interview um, the aqueduct manager for DWP. It was a long process to, to get access to, to um, get that interview. I also, I think there's that small exchange with um, James Yanata and um, Andy Lipkiss at that one meeting, right? And so, um, so we interviewed DWP thinking, oh, you know, balance, it'd be interesting, we can use it to sort of um, contrast so that you could see where they were coming from. But it was all so, it was like a salesperson, really. It wasn't very genuine about really what the issues were. And so it just didn't, it didn't add anything to what people I think already would would know. So, um, you know, it took a lot of effort to get that interview, but ultimately this film is not about them. It's it's really the perspective of these communities. And so it, it just didn't stay in the film. Um, and, and, but I think that it was an important. It was important to to really do that. I will also say that, um, uh, you know, through the introduction of Andy Lipkiss, I spoke to Melavine, and Melavine has a really important history with Manzanar because he was an assemblyman when, um, you know, they were trying to get support to establish it as a as a historic site, and so he really gave his support to this cause and it was through him that you know i think he he to his credit you know was a big supporter which helped to tip 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 the balance there so now he's the president of the um the the LADWB board of commissioners right so he's in a very important position and he has this history with this place and he also has this connection through DWP so when i talked to him you know, he's, he was very gracious. He was very flattered to talk to me. But then when I said, well, but the film does come to the present. And so we also would like to ask you about these relationships with Native Americans. And, you know, and I wasn't going to sugarcoat it. I wasn't going to try to trick him into, you know, you know, to say something. And so he's, as an independent sort of, he, as a citizen, you know, he he could do it. But, you know, of course... He's beholden to DWP, and so when he talked to them, I think they they felt like, oh, we can't really control what he's going to say. So he mm -hmm. said, I, I, politely, I, I have to decline. So and I really was hopeful to be able to incorporate his perspective because he has a history to this place. He has a real relationship. And it really wasn't my intention to sort of make the, paint them as bad guys. It's a hard job to you know, administrate these resources, but, you know, that's Well, in a sense, we're all indicted. I mean, we live in Southern California, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as I was watching, I was kind of do, doing some soul searching too. And even Monica says, we should be living closer to the water tables. It's like, well, I'm, I guess I'm not helping out, thanks. So I guess it's, you know, a, a larger conversation, right? About these kind of topics. It is, but I also don't think it's individual change. Mm. I do no. think it's a systemic, larger, structural, structural mm -hmm. challenge, right? And so, yes, all of us can, can do our due diligence and take shorter showers and, and think about where we live, but also, ultimately, it is a massive structural uh, crisis. And our climate crisis and our water crises will not be solved by us taking shorter showers or not watering our lawn individually. We need entire structural um, institutional changes to, to meet those. So I, I also don't like folks to stay in the guilt too long because mm -hmm. I'd rather us be angry and go hold the powers that be accountable <laughs> <laughs> than feel guilty at home. <laughs> okay. That's where, you know, being aware is really, really important mm -hmm. because you can exercise that voice, you know, through your doing your civic duty as you vote and put pressure on your government, you know, official. So... That's what that's what Andy says and it's true. Yeah. So my grandma said too.
<laughs> well, that's a wonderful note to end on. Um, I want to thank our three panelists, Naomi Hirahara. Thank you so much. And I do have a qu question for you, but I'm going to ask it outside okay. about how one of the main characters in, in her books is Mas Arai, who's a Japanese gardener. So there's this whole tie and connection, and I'm really curious about your reactions to the film, given that Masarai comes from Hiroshima and the, the whole thing. I know I've read all the books. Anyway, you should read <laughs> Naomi's books. They're absolutely fantastic. Uh, Monica, you're such an inspiration. Um, really incredible to have you here. I'm so glad that you could join us. Um, and you are inspiring to our students, and my students are also inspiring to me, and I really appreciate that all of you came tonight. It means a lot to have you here. I know it's a really busy time of year, so we really appreciate that. And Anne, this film is incredible. It's really beautiful. Um, I, I, I want to watch it like a few more times, at least uh, per year, per month. You know, <laughs> it's it's just like there's so much to interpret f from from this. And and Alan, um, I just wanted to say thank you to our dean of faculty for. Mm -hmm his really lovely introduction and for being part of this event. I, I really appreciate it. So all four of you, thank you so much. And please, uh, let's give them a hand and please join us outside for refreshments. I'll, I'll just make one quick plug. Um, the film is going to be screened on PBS on, in July. It's going to be on POV. It'll have a national broadcast. And then, um, you know, this survey is also partly for us to get a gauge on people, what people know, what people don't know, also to add you to our mailing list. So if that's of interest, or if you know other people who might be interested in the film, please, you know, fill that out or get in touch. I mean, obviously, I, I'm easy access. I'm here. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, but we'll be doing many more um, impact activities around the film. Um, as we get closer and then after the after the screening, but spread the word since I mean, it will, mm -hmm. it will be a shorter version than this one, but um, spread the word. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks. 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 Thanks.